if somebody's listening to this and they're looking to design their dream life in roughly 30 days, what do you think it would take? Uh, I mean, I don't like to be flippant, but uh, a complete reorientation of what they're trying to do. <laughs> Meaning, gosh, it's it's beautiful, right? Yeah, even the question, it's so founded in this sort of aspirational quality that we have as a human being. Like, I want to create my dream life in 30 days. But what I think it omits and it tends to negate is the fact that that to me isn't life. Like we as human beings are sort of wired to try and avoid adversity. We seek pleasure. We want to avoid pain. You know, these are very mammalian, deep primal instincts. So whilst I would be a great cheerleader, you know, if somebody wants to do that, I'd be like, good for you, go for it. And I don't want to be the guy that's, you know, sort of the curmudgeon, but I just don't think it's a, I think they're digging in the wrong place, you know, to use a quote that I steal from Raiders of the Lost Ark when Indiana Jones discovered that the French archaeologist and all of his, you know, thousands of workers and the big JCB diggers and, you know, sort of corporate America looking for the Ark of the Covenant were digging in the wrong place, right? They're sort of represents the ego that wants to have all the accolades, the attention, the fame, the riches. And whilst, again, I, I don't want to step on anyone's goals and aspirations, but life doesn't work like that. You need only look at your history as a human being, as a man, that we're going to have to face adversity. People are going to die. People are going to get sick. Money is going to be lost. Jobs are going to be, you know, given up. And so whilst the 30 days dream life is beautiful to pursue, I think a much more powerful and dreamy life is to learn to find profound acceptance for the one we have. That to me is a much deeper interpretation of success. I've often said to me, true success is being at peace. And what I hear in someone trying to create their dream life in 30 days is a lot of effort, is, is a lot of fatigue, a lot of trying, a lot of trying to prove something. And I know it's a fine line, right? I'm not just saying like acceptance as though it's a form of resignation. But to what degree can we find enough humility as a human being to allow the events of life to unfold, but not be so upset by them, right? Versus trying to create this perfect circumstance. You know, when I, when I asked the question, I, I guess I wasn't intending to say, okay, just for somebody to have the McMansion and to be driving the, the sports cars and be living on the beach. But I think that people, their dream in life is to find peace, fulfillment, meaning and purpose. And there's a lot of people right now that don't have that. So if people are lacking peace in their life, they're lacking fulfillment and happiness. And like you said, sometimes we're digging in the wrong hole. Which hole do you think people should start digging into? So right there, it's, and I really get it. Like there's millions of people who are struggling. The last few years have been you know, tiring for everybody. Uh, there's definitely forces at play here that don't have humanity's best interests at heart. And in order to find peace, it is incumbent upon us to see where are we not allowing life to be the way it is. So fundamentally, the opposite of peace is resistance. It's fighting, like where we are in conflict with the circumstances of our life, right? And so for me, the way to have a dream life is to take a few deep breaths and discover within us where is their resistance to the way things are. Now, very subtle but important distinction is not to say that I want them the way they are, like I don't want my parents to be struggling with a sickness or to be diagnosed with cancer. I don't want to be unemployed right now. I don't want to be struggling in my relationships. It's not to condone the circumstances, 
but can we just for now find profound acceptance for the fact that life is the way it is so that to me is success that to me is fulfillment that is like okay for whatever reasons for whatever reasons and let's face it we're all pretty clueless when we uh, look at the big scheme of life things are the way they are and the degree to which i resist them i don't want it this way it's sort of like an inner child tantrum like no i don't want it you know and that's where the mental sicknesses the diseases come in because we're literally fighting reality so a dream life to me isn't as you said mansions and fast cars and da 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 a dream life is being at peace you talk about resistance and i think a lot of people who maybe haven't done a lot of personal development work maybe they're not you know familiar with the subconscious mind and reprogramming and stuff they're not even aware that they're creating resistance in their life based on their own beliefs or based on some of the habits that they might participate in on a regular basis. How can somebody develop self-awareness around some of these habits or resistances that they're creating on their own if they're not fully aware of it? It's a great question. You know, we only sort of have our life, right? So we only have our experience. We don't have the the liberty of contrast we can't go okay i'm going to just live on a different timeline as a different human being and see how that feels so a lot of people just don't know what they don't know like their form of resistance that somebody else might see very clearly for them is no that's just normal that's just me <laughs> the way to start to be aware of it is first of all people have to slow down everybody's in a hurry as i tell people everyone's in a hurry to get somewhere they're not under the impression that that's where they're going to be happy. Even in the Declaration of Independence, right? It's the pursuit of happiness. There's this manic chase that people have of they're constantly trying to get somewhere. So if you feel that as a listener, if you feel like you're on the quintessential hamster wheel rat race of life, then chances are you're in a state of resistance. You're feeling that the life you have isn't the one you want. It's not the one you're supposed to have. It's not the one your parents said you should have. It's not the one your teachers or your friends say you should have. So wherever this is, this sort of fighting energy, then that's where we start to find some gold and go, okay, what, what is it that I, I, the person, am fundamentally resisting? Why, why do I believe things should be different? And that's where we can at least start the inquiry to these deeper subconscious patterns of thinking that I'm not enough, or I'm not safe, or I'm not loved, or I'm not wanted. It's usually some sort of not, N-O-T, that people are fighting. And I want to talk about this, lim the limiting belief, I'm not enough. I mean, you hear this a lot from people. I've definitely had this struggle over the years. I would imagine, you know, in your life, you've had it at some point as well. And it holds us back in so many areas of our life, whether it's pursuing happiness, whether it's relationship stuff, relationship to ourself, fitness, money, wh whatever it is, purpose. How can somebody begin to like transform that limiting belief into something that empowers them? Through the beauty of accepting our humanity, right? Which isn't an easy thing to do. One of my quotes is say, one of the hardest things to do as a human is to be human. <laughs> and that's to realize that we all have that program. We all have feelings of inadequacy. We all have feelings of self-hatred. We all have self-judgment. We all have a feeling of insecurity as it relates to our actual safety on the planet, which is being heightened right now. Whilst most people are trying to disprove it, deny it, overcome it, hide it, the actual access to freedom is to go, oh, that's just part of the programming of a human being and to integrate it, accept it. Like we're not, we're not running around judging the shit out of ourselves for the fact that we have two arms. So it's, it's part of the design of the anatomy of a being a human. So like, Fuck, I should have four, you know, it's like, right. So we, we, we integrate it by virtue of the fact that it's, yeah, that's common knowledge that you as a human, assuming you don't have any genetic, malformations and genetic mutations that you you have two arms so likewise when we look at our psyches we look at our identities our personalities it's to realize oh just by virtue of being human you are going to have a narrative that is founded in some form of 
I'm not enough. And that's okay. And when you, when you really get it and you really integrate it, you no longer are driven by it. You're not trying to hide it. You're not trying to become a perfectionist to compensate. You're not trying to become a people pleaser as a strategic way of trying to be enough, right? All of the things, the mechanisms that people use as coping strategies start to fall by the wayside and you're just not defined by it. It's like Peter Crone, when I was in college, my nickname was Perfect Pete, right? Which you can feel the pressure in that, that I felt, which was self-generated by the fact that I always had to get everything, you know, back then kind of perfect, which was my way of compensating for my not enoughness until I realized it was futile because there's no such thing as perfect. Everybody's flawed. And the degree to which we can embrace that about ourselves comes back to your original question is the degree to which we get to live a dream life because we're no longer fighting who we are. And so once we have this, it seems like radical acceptance of us being human, like you just said, which is the gateway to improving our relationship with this limiting belief. I mean, a lot of this stuff is just deep rooted in people. I mean, you got people that grew up in traumatic situations. You got people that battled drug addiction for a long time that just self-destructed their life. And their their feeling of not enough isn't just something that pops into their mind every once in a while. It's like deeply there given their track record. Is there, you know, I guess staying on the theme of like having somebody design their quote unquote dream life in 30 days, finding peace, happiness, et cetera. Would there be like any kind of exercises or any or anything similar to that you would have somebody do to help like rewire that thought so it's not just you know you're accepting it but it's also like you're starting to believe it as well yeah it takes time right there's different ways that the subconscious gets its structure uh the different dialogues that we have typically the most common that people struggle with is what happens in childhood we're very open we're kind of like tape recorders so we hear things as though it's factual like dad says you know well what happened why did you up and get a d or you know the if it's a high school coach that you dropped the ball literally figuratively you know and you feel like you messed up the the team's record and you didn't get the win or whatever it is that we all go through we record those things as though they're factual and that's who we are so the first thing is you know patience kindness forgiveness for oneself which isn't easy and to realize that, you know, we have deep codes that are very primal. We want to belong. We want to be safe. We want to be loved as humans. That's how we survive. And that those things aren't easy just to, you know, transcend or transform. So patience, kindness towards oneself. And then to realize that, you know, we're all doing the best we can and that these things tend to be blind spots, right? So to redesign, I like to use analogies. Like if I came into your house, and I saw the way that everything was laid out, your furniture, your sofa, where the TV is, where the sideboard is, where your bookshelves are, whatever it is. And you could say, I want to design my dream home. So the first thing we have to do as an analogy to what we're talking about mentally and emotionally is we'd have to clean out everything that's in there, right? Like if I just bought in the most exquisite, cloud couches from restoration hardware, they're 20 grand or whatever, and just bring them into your house right now. You're like, what the f*** are you doing? Like, there's, where the hell am I supposed to put this? There's no room, right? And so this is where people try to do affirmations, positive thinking, you know, positive psychology, where they're like trying to repeat things, but it's it's one of my friends who plays golf and he, he made a putt for like a seven or an eight on a par four, right? Not good. Like it was a triple bogey. But he made it, it was like a 50 foot putt. And people are like, oh my God, great putt. And he's like, yeah, whipped cream on shit, right? Like it, it's a great putt, but I still scored a seven, right? <laughs> so likewise, if I bring in all of this great information, tips, how-tos, furniture in your house, but the house is still filled with moldy, you know, old furniture, doesn't work, right? So to come back to the question, to make it as practical as I can, People first have to become aware of what is the dialogue that you currently have that is your quote unquote old furniture and start to investigate the validity of that. Why, why do you think you're a piece of shit? Why do you think you're a failure? Why do you think you're not enough? Why do you think you're a loser? Why do you think that you're not worth anything? Right. And then 
it's hard to look at because it's 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 uncomfortable, right? It hurts to feel those things. But in order to do the real healing and to design the perfect life or the dream life, we have to be responsible for what's already in the space, right? What what do we and have we carried for usually 20, 30 years that isn't a truth, but it is nonetheless what defines us. So that that's that's the tool is self-awareness. What do I fundamentally think about who, who I am and then question the truth about? It. Is it really true, like an absolute truth that I'm a loser? And when you really look at it, it's, it's not a truth. It's how I feel. My dad said it all the time. My brother's picked on me. You know, you've got the evidence for it, but it's not a truth. So do you believe that affirmations are mostly BS? I mean, BS is a strong word. I would say mostly not very helpful. <laughs> you know, I think for some people, sure, it might give some transitory relief. It's sort of like the lift yourself up by your bootstraps, like you're a good person, you're a winner, like whatever people say. I just find that they tend to be short lived because until you deal with the underlying code, the deeper memories of inadequacy, insecurity, and scarcity, the deeper dialogues and narratives, Again, it's back to whipped cream on shit. You know, it's like, I'd rather get rid of the shit. And then the space for all the whipped cream in the world. The irony is when I get rid of the derogatory statements I have about myself, I tend to naturally feel at peace anyway. You know, it seems obviously that these derogatory statements, these some of these limiting beliefs are just poor habits that people need to not necessarily just get rid of, like, because it's going to take time. They're going to need to work on them and understand them, gain some introspection on them. What are some other habits that you think there may be or subtle that people aren't aware of that people need to break in order to find peace and live this dream life? I think the worst habit is not so much an action. It's just a form of self narrative, right? Like, so the habits that people do, like whether it be overindulging in food, overindulging in narcotics, drugs, medication, drinking, weed, food, you know, what? there's different means that people seek uh, escape from their own suffering. Like that's the actions people are doing, but they're all secondary and tertiary. They're down the line relative to somebody's worst habit, which is the way they speak about themselves to themselves. So that's the, that's the habit to pay attention to is the consistent inner dialogue that is very derogatory, not flattering. And it's hard to really sit with that, right? Because we're so accustomed to thinking that the voice in my head is who I am versus listening to the voice in my head as though it's not me and get to know that person, right? And it breeds a lot of compassion. It's like, whoa, that person is so hard on themselves. That person has the worst image of themselves. That person is just so mean to themselves. Like, wow. So if you were listening to a friend of yours speak in the way that you speak to yourself, you'd be like, dude, what are you, what are you doing? You're like, you're beating the shit out of yourself. You're a good person, right? You'd have compassion. You'd have support. You'd have love. Um, so you start to realize that we really are not very kind in the way that we speak to ourselves. And so how do we break that habit? Because that's something that, again, is very subconscious. It is. But, but through that's what I said. Unless you slow down enough to pay attention and listen, which is what some people don't do in their own relationships, right? They don't pay attention to their wife or their husband or their kids. They're, everybody's in a hurry to get somewhere. So that's why I came back to earlier saying we've got to slow down. We've got to be able to pay attention and go, okay, sometimes it helps to take the thoughts we have and write them out so you can see them. Like it feels separate, right? If they're in our head, feels like it's who I am. But if we take them out, put them on paper and start to record, what are at least the consistent thoughts, right? Because some thoughts come and go, some are pretty arbitrary, but there's usually some consistent things we say about ourselves. So to break the habit, we want to bring those consistent thoughts into our awareness. You share it with a loving friend, you put it on a piece of paper, you share it with a therapist, you talk to someone in a workshop, and then start to, as I said earlier, investigate the validity of the statements because it's not a truth it's just how i feel it's an opinion i have 
And that's how we start to break the habit is because when you realize it's not true, you start to pay less attention. You're like, oh, hang on a minute. And then to make it more powerful, the question I ask people when I work them is, who could you be? Or who would you be in the absence of that statement or derogatory narrative? Because that now opens something up. People are like, wow, wow, if I if I wasn't walking around thinking I'm a loser, if that wasn't there, I'd feel amazing. Right. You see, it's like it naturally reveals uh something that we're trying to get to through affirmations or chasing this idealized future. And I know for me and others, what's tended to to trap us or myself from changing in situations like this, even though we've understood that, you know, we're not quote unquote failures is the real the reality that we see around us just doesn't reflect that you have no money, your relationships are crap. Um, you've broken the trust of every single person in your life. Maybe there's some legal stuff going on. And so you're like, yeah, I understand I'm, I'm not a failure, but my life is still crap. So how do, do you think that somebody has to also improve their, their their life, like make more money or improve relationships in order to bridge that gap between thinking they're a failure and realizing they're not? Yeah, it's it's a little bit like I made the analogy of like a freeway and a side road, right? To me, the freeway with five lines, five lanes on either side versus the side street with one lane on either side, that represents the mind altering body and life. Right. Like that's that's the real. Now, can you get your ass up, go to the gym, try and get a little motivated, maybe say a couple of affirmations, tidy out your garage and feel better? For sure. For sure. These are important habits to, you know, in, implement into our life that we are taking care of our circumstances. You clean out your closet. I mean, there's a whole woman show on Netflix, Marie Kondo or whatever. Like, you know, she's got millions of people helping them roll up t-shirts, right? And does that help? Yes. But the real treasure is in those five lanes, those 10 lanes of a highway where it's the constant dialogue because the relationships that suck, not having money, not having, you know, your life together, having health issues, those are the byproducts of what's been going on for years in between the years, right? So (laughs) <laughs> it's your skin, like when somebody has a skin issue, uh, whether it's psoriasis, eczema, acne, like people try to apply something externally, cortisols, whatever creams. But the issue is arising from inside the tissues, right? So until you change, in this case, diet, lifestyle, mindset, stress responses, your, your skin isn't going to look different. So likewise, our life is an extension of us. And if our energy internally is in a state of dis-ease or disorder, dysfunction, then the world around us is going to reflect that. That's the good news, right? Because then we're like, okay, instead of being a victim of circumstance, I can see that my energy is the precursor and the creative force of my circumstances. Not like I'm at fault. We don't want to make ourselves guilty or shameful. That doesn't help. We go, okay, if my life is the way it is because of who I am, then by changing who I am, then my life will change automatically versus me staying the same inadequate, insecure person who thinks they're a failure, but desperately trying to change my life. That's that's a futile battle. I would imagine that some of the good habits people should instill are kind of opposite of what we've talked about. You mentioned them a little bit, like be, slowing down, becoming aware of your thoughts, becoming aware of the narrative you're telling yourself and working on that. I think that's a good practice to have for anybody, no matter what stage of life they're in. You mentioned diet, stress response, fitness, etc. What are some of the good habits you'd want to make sure somebody is instilling in themselves if they're a client of yours and they're trying to you know, transform their their life in 30 days? Uh, I think for sure, having self-awareness to start, right? To start to recognize what are your consistent thoughts? What are the words that come out of your mouth? Like how many times have we heard friends say really, you know, quite derogatory comments about themselves? Oh, I'm such an idiot. I fucked up. Like to pay attention to the words we use because those words create our reality. So those for sure are key habits. But then just in terms of maintenance of being human, it's not easy, right? So 
consistent sleep cycles. Try to get to bed at the same time every night, ideally before 10 p.m. You know, if you get into 10 p.m. and beyond, you tend to get into a different cycle energetically. You're going to get second wind. You start to feel like motivated. You're hungry. Those sort of midnight snacks that happen. Um, so try to get to bed at a consistent time. Try to watch the sunrise or light some of the sunlight in the morning to set your circadian rhythms. Move your body, right? Whether it's like you go for a walk, you do yoga, you do a hip training exercise, whatever floats your boat, but move your body, right? If you can, do some breath work. Start to get in tune with those subtle bodies. What happens when I'm really focused on my breathing? Some people prefer a form of meditation. Eat good food, chew your food, you know, have good community. Uh, these are all the sort of the go-tos that everybody I think is pretty aware of. Of course, we don't always integrate them well. We don't keep them consistent. But I think the main ones are, you know, good sleep hygiene in terms of what time you go to bed, the way that you sleep. You're not looking at your device until the minute you shut your eyes. Uh, you get up hopefully at a decent time in the morning and you move your body, get hydrated, eat good food. And as best as you can during the course of the day, do something that contributes to the benefit of society. If somebody's feeling unhappy and they're looking to use this 30 days of finding peace in their life, designing their dream life to find ways to be like realistically happy, not having their happiness driven by money, status, et cetera. What are some of the, like the cornerstones of happiness that people should focus on? Well, when I write in quotes, I don't know how familiar you are with my work, but I'm doing my first book and I write in quotes. That's how my intel and distinctions come through me. And so the one around happiness that I am proud of, that people like, I say true happiness is the absence of the search for happiness. So it seems like paradoxical for some people because what I'm saying is, similar to what I mentioned earlier, when we're okay with the, uh, the way things are, that is the absence of the cert. We're not trying to perfect our circumstances. We're not trying to become someone. We're not trying to get somewhere. Then that to me is true happiness. That's peace. I'm at peace with the way things are. And, and capital A, I remain committed to whatever my goals and aspirations are. You know, Peter Crone, despite my success, pretty healthy guy, good athlete, you know, got good things in my life. There's so many things I'm exploring, but not from a place of lack, not from a place of there's something wrong with my life. So that happiness, no offense to whatever the 30 day, I don't know if you're doing a 30 day program or something, but you know, it's like, it's available right now. Happiness is not to be found at the end of 30 days. It's to be found instantaneously when you are in profound relationship to the way things are and not in resistance to the way things are. I mean, I know we've, we've talked about awareness and I know that's a big part of your work. I'm just putting myself in a, in a listener's shoes and they're like, all right, if happiness is the absence of the search for happiness, and I'm somebody that has just constantly searched for the next, when I get this, I'll be happy. When I get the car, when I get the relationship, and that's just been this constant toxic cycle, how do they break free from that? Because I think that's a trap that can be incredibly hard to to get out of, especially because in the, in the way our society is, there's so much value put on those things. For sure. That is apparently what success looks like, right? And so we're all wired to think that the, the life we really want when it's going to be awesome is this sort of one day future. So again, it's just through logic and intelligence and realizing, wait, have, have you ever been in your future? Right? And it's like, of course, no one has. So you're chasing this perpetual horizon that keeps moving with you because Whatever somebody's goals are, let's say they want to make a million bucks and they do. Well, guess what? Now they want to make three. They want to make five. Now I need to make 10 because their lifestyle is going to adjust with them. The number of people who want to help and support from them because they've made money or whatever it is in their life. So the same pressures apply. So it is, it's, it's a trap, right? To think that what we want is off in the future. And we, as cliche as it is, we, we're sort of forgetting the life that's right in front of our nose right now. And so the, the, the how is to one, notice the lies that your success is in the future, one day when, to realize the part of you that thinks that what you want is going to give you happiness. Because look at your own life. Like how many times did you think that when I got to whatever particular milestone, that would be it. But you hit that milestone and it wasn't. 
Well, you've got probably a bunch of evidence to show that your idea of what you think you have to get to, which you did get to with previous goals, doesn't reconcile your suffering. It just doesn't get rid of the resistance. So to see that the trap itself is what's perpetuating this pursuit of an idealized future that you never get to. So that's the first thing is just the awareness and go, oh my God, like I'm literally just chasing a horizon of my own creation. We've talked a lot about self and I know a lot of your work revolves around reprogramming the self, improving the self. Again, I'm only just speaking from my own experience. When I've been the unhappiest with my life, it's been because I've been unhappy with myself. And it's not even that I'm chasing the wrong things. I'm just in a place where I just feel like I have a low level of self-worth, self-esteem. What do you think are some things that somebody could do other than, like we've talked about the awareness around the thoughts and you know not believing that you're destined to be failure and et cetera. What are some things somebody could do to really improve the way they feel about themselves? So let me ask you, if you have you at any point had a friend, a loved one who felt pretty low about themselves? For sure. For sure, right? We all have. We've had stacks of friends who've gone through a breakup and they think life is pointless. They got laid off from their job and they're like, well, fuck it, like nobody wants me. Like, you know, we're surrounded by humans who show us what it looks like to feel uh, like resigned and apathetic and lethargic and there's no point to life. So then to answer your own question, what is your response to that person? How do you deal with that? I mean, I try to just listen to them first, not try to fix the situation, right? And just hear them out. And then I, if I know them well enough, I try to remind them of what they have overcome and some of the things that they have achieved and how strong they are and just be there for them and support and and just kind of ride with them along that journey. And also just try to you know, ask them if they want my feedback. And if they want my feedback, I'm like, hey, this is what I would do in your situation, blah, blah, blah. Um, it, it all depends on the situation, but but pretty much, I mean, it's like me listening to them, helping them gain awareness of the situation and then pointing out, you know, some of their strengths in those moments that they that people tend to forget about. Well, what I got overall was the fact that basically you would be a friend, you'd be kind, you'd be caring, you'd be patient, you'd be understanding, you'd you know, we could put that all under the auspices of you just be loving, right? So that's the answer to your question. We're just applying those same qualities, values to ourselves and realizing, wow, it's okay. I can see that you feel like you fucked up. You, it's okay that you feel like nobody wants you. It's okay that you feel like you're not making the most of your life. Like the, the it's all okay. It's all okay. And the amount of relief that we feel when we can afford ourselves the same love and kindness that we so readily afford to a friend, it's the catalyst for us to feel the qualities, the good attributes and characteristics that we do have beneath the surface. And then we naturally are pulled into getting up, go for a walk. You know what? I'm going to be okay. I'm going to have a good workout. I'm going to have a sweat. Like we're not in the woe as me we're allowing for the woe is me but the it's so ironic right as soon as we allow for something to be there it tends to dissipate <laughs> i feel like acceptance is like one of the, the biggest things you can do in those situations because otherwise you fall into this victim shame cycle of why is this happening to me i feel so alone i'm never gonna amount to anything i'm never gonna fill in the blank and then you just prolong the misery you put prolong the despair because you have you don't accept that that's just part of the human experience and then you figure out a way to to move on from there yeah and the ego the reason that happens just so the listeners get a little bit of inside intel is because the ego's number one prerogative is to be right about itself so if we can stay in the woe is me if we can stay in it's all pointless then what we're doing is we're fueling the ego's need for its own validation. And I know that the ego gets in the way of our own success, gets in the way of our own happiness and our own peace. What have you found to be some effective ways to have a better relationship with our ego so that it doesn't bring us down? Not to sound like a broken record, but that profound love and acceptance to realize as a human being, by design, I have a part of me that feels inadequate, insecure, feels like there's stuff missing that is fundamentally 
founded in self-judgment, self-criticism, uh, separation, and to learn. I mean, what a great attribute of this organism of being human that we have a part of us that by design feels flawed, feels inadequate, feels imperfect, feels not wanted, so that then we, the bigger being, we're learning to have love and acceptance of that part, right? Meaning, if we look at the other way around, how many of your listeners, male or female, they have attributes about themselves that they love, like their features, their, their jawline, their, their hips, their lips, their boobs, their, you know, whatever it is like, that people like. Well, that doesn't take any work because you like those things about you. So how beautiful of a design that you're, by virtue of being human, we are all given attributes that are really unattractive to ourselves. Because then we actually have to develop the capacity to love those parts of us that we're hoping somebody else will, not realizing that all the other humans out there are doing the same thing. We're, you, you start to see the irony, the paradox, and the, the comedy in the fact that we want somebody else to love and accept us, even though we won't. <laughs> Speaking of relationships, I think this is a big one as far as getting in the way of our peace, happiness, getting us to feel a certain way about ourselves. You touched on it you know, earlier in the conversation where it's like we don't slow down to pay attention to our partners, our husbands, our wives, fill in the blank with whatever, with whoever is listening to this. I know a big part of your work is on relationships. If you could just provide the, the listeners with some some of your best tips to improve the quality of their overall relationships, what would they be? It's a great question. Um, I would say every relationship we have with anyone resides within us. So we think we're upset at our wife, our boss, but the, the upset is in us. So if you want to improve your relationships to others, as you know, trite or repetitive as it might sound, we have to improve our relationship with ourselves, right? If I can embrace my humanity, if I can find love and acceptance for the part of me that I find difficult to love and accept, then I'm going to naturally extend that to others. I'm going to be more patient. I'm going to be more forgiving. I'm going to be more accepting. So right now, the way most relationships are kind of constructed or designed, not consciously, is that I'll be okay if you behave the way I want you to. That's not even a relationship with the other person. Because you're saying, I need you to be a particular type of person for me to be okay. That's me with me, not me with you. So first thing to realize is that most people don't have a relationship with other people. They have a relationship with their own idea of how those people should act. And once you see that, it's pretty, it's pretty tough to see, especially for people you love, right? You say, oh, no, I love my wife. But when you realize, actually, no, you want your life, your wife to be different, then you're not loving your wife. You're loving the idea of who you want her to be. That's not a relationship. So when people start to realize why their relationships don't work is because they're not in relationships, it's quite eye-opening. <laughs> <laughs> and so you think the best thing somebody can do is just continually work on themselves so that, you know, whatever problems do arise in the relationship, it's not, it's not you know, jaded in any way. Yeah, it, it's recognizing the pressure that we put on ourselves that then gets superimposed onto others, the judgment that we have on ourselves that then manifests as making other people wrong, right? I, I didn't get the memo from the universe that any one of us is in charge of how things should be and how anyone should act. But that's how people behave. Like they, they know how their spouse, boss, siblings, parents should act. So like, really? Oh, okay. I, I didn't get my marching orders of who I'm spent, meant to be in your life, right? You start to see the audacity of the ego's mindset that it knows how everybody should act. So when you start to see the absolute insanity of that, it breeds a lot more humility and you start to realize, wait a minute, who am I? Who am I to say how other people should act? that immediately breeds a lot more love and acceptance and allows people to be who they are. Now, that doesn't mean we condone certain behavior. Of course, if someone's in an abusive 
a harmful relationship, then for sure you need to get out of that, seek counsel, get yourself in a safe place. But if you're the one perpetrating the wrong making and the judgment and the shame of another person, you know, then that's something to look at in terms of the audacity you have thinking you know how somebody else should act. That's not a relationship with another human being. That's a relationship with your own ideal of who someone should be. That's a fictitious relationship. That's why most relationships don't work. You're not in relationship with the people around you. You're in relationship with your own imagination about them. And so how can somebody know if their relationship with themselves is on point and they're not having this imaginative relationship of what somebody else should be? Because they'll find harmony wherever they go. They'll find kindness. They'll find forgiveness. They'll find connection and intimacy. And I mean, intimacy is an energetic experience, like where I feel really seen and heard and held by the people around me, and they equally feel the same from me. That's being in relationship versus fighting, judging, wrongmaking, arguing, screaming, getting angry, which is how most people live. Like you said, there's also a difference between, you know, somebody who's in an abusive, abusive relationship and a harmful relationship and they need to get out of it. One of the things that my audience has shared they struggle with at times is finding people around them that have like common values. Like you mentioned that, you know, you, you told me before we recorded one of the main reasons that you've gone back to L.A. for some time is because of the community. You talked about like having good people in your life is important for people's you know, happiness and habits and stuff like that. So let's just say for the sake of this conversation, somebody has their incongruency with themselves. There's alignment there. They're not focusing on trying to make somebody they're not, but they want to make sure they're not, you know, wanting to do drugs. They stay away from people who aren't doing drugs. Like how can people make sure that they're finding the right types of people in their life to elevate them and not bring them down? It's tough, right? I mean, it's the old, everyone's seen the meme of Fuck around and find out, right? Like it's all a work in progress. We're all just sort of like, as I tell people, we're, we're masterpieces and works in progress, right? So I, I have friends that maybe I won't have in a year or two from now, but then I'll have new friends come into my life. And so it's really all an extension and a reflection of who we are. So again, uh, I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but I want to keep pointing people to the source of everything, which is if you want to be surrounded by amazing people that care about you with people who are kind, who are loving, who accept you, who support you, who lift you up, then you have to be that person for yourself, right? That's the ultimate relationship that we're developing. So in order to attract good partners, whether it be personally, romantic, professionally, whatever it is, we want to find that beautiful relationship with ourselves. What's been something that you've been working on for yourself over the last six months to a year or so that's helped improve your own relationship with yourself? All the above. Like, I, I, like, I mean, everything that I just shared in terms of, you know, I think when, when I have worked with so many high-end performers in life, athletes, entertainers, billionaires, people who excel in their industry, right? Some of the best professional sports people, there tends to be this underlying constraint of expectation that once somebody gets really good at something, it's almost like inbuilt that that's what they're now expecting, right? So I take one of my baseball players who was the National League uh, MVP, which is a big deal, right? Like, you know, out of all the players to be the MVP, and the reason he got that a couple of seasons ago, I would say, is because he actually made space for his humanity. Instead of being the guy who was getting upset for striking out, which makes sense because you're being paid millions of dollars to not strike out, but I've yet to meet a player who doesn't, right? And they're the best in the world. So the reason for sharing that is, you know, if I can share as humbly as possible, I feel like I'm one of the greatest performers of what I do. Right? I'm not a baseball player, I'm not an NBA guy, I'm not an actor, but in my realm, in my industry, I get a lot of accolades, I get the best of the best seeking my counsel. So there's this underlying understanding that I'm really good at what I do. Now within that, there is then the, the sort of potentially fatal flaw of thinking I should always be good at what I do, or Peter Crone should always be happy, or Peter Crone should always be free, or Peter Crone should always be pleasant. So what I've been working on to answer your question is to realize that's just not a truth. I can be human. I can be hurt. 
I can be upset. I can second guess myself. And making space for that ironically makes me more, it enhances my capacity to help others. So the irony is in allowing space for me not being the best at what I do, I become better at what I do because I allow for my humanity to be part of my vocation and my purpose. How can somebody be comfortable when things are unfair in life and don't go their way? I mean, there's a lot of people that just stuff happens. It gets in their way and it's easy to to just get upset at the world because the reality is it's just not fair and it's very unfortunate. How can people respond to that? I think again in words, right? Like I, I was orphaned by the age of 17. My mom died when I was seven. My dad went to work when I was 17, never came back. And I was an only child. And no one would begrudge me if I said that was totally unfair. No one. They'd be like, that, that is, that's totally unfair. That's awful. But the expression unfair is the trap. It might be, like you said, unfortunate. It might be unexpected. It might be unpleasant. But I think if we live in the world of it's unfair, now we're a victim. Now you're. F so anytime we use dialogues or excuses to be a victim of anything, we're pushing ourselves into that black hole of the ego where there is no resolution. So I don't look at life as unfair. I look at life as it's just what it is. The unfairness is in our head. It's in our reaction. It's in our response. It doesn't mean that it's easy. It doesn't mean it's what we want. It doesn't mean that it's without challenges. But that at some level we could say is the beauty of life. Like we've signed up for a pretty cool game. Like if I put you in front of a TV screen with a joystick to play a video game and all you had to do is your little character move from the left side of the screen and you just move the joystick to the right and you go across the right side of the screen, and then it goes, congratulations, you've got to level two. And you're like, okay. And then you go to the right again and congratulations, level three. And you're like, well, at what point am I going to face some fucking ghouls, demons, ghosts, or bad guys, right? Like this game is pretty fucking boring. Okay, well, same with life. Is it really unfair that we're being handed these quote unquote challenges? Or is that part of us becoming a better player? Right? Is that part of us becoming a better human where we evolve because we're facing adversity? And that victim trap is really easy to fall into. And also the pessimism trap where people just feel unhappy, miserable, cynical because of the way... I'm more than familiar with it as a human. Yeah. <laughs> I know you talk a lot about acceptance of the human experience and just seeing things for what they are and self-awareness. Has there been anything that you found to be effective for yourself when you're, when you're, you know, feeling in that kind of, when you're feeling that way to be able to get you in a more optimistic state of mind so that you can move forward and, and kind of work your way out of whatever victim trap you may have fallen into? For sure. I think uh, radical humility, you know, that I've worked with, I don't know how many billionaires I've worked with, out of how many incredible athletes. And they all f up. They all fail. Their kids don't like them. A kid ends up in rehab. You know, it's like shit goes wrong. And so humility to realize that it's not about perfecting our circumstances or ourselves, right? So for me, that's the first place. And then counsel, friends, people that love you, you know, people that care, people who are willing to listen. You know, something that Peter Crone has had to work a lot on is. Uh, asking for help. That was never a strength of mine. My conditioning was such that I was an only child, orphaned, forced into this view of being by myself, figure it out all by myself. So whilst it's allowed me to amass an incredible amount of capacity to deal with life and intelligence to be able to work myself out of most wet paper bags I find myself in, you know, I'm learning to receive. I'm learning to ask for help. I'm learning to afford other people the opportunity to find value in making a difference in my life. You know, the number of friends who uh, of late have said, it's about fucking dime. I, you've helped me for 20 years. I can't do shit for you. you, know, so, <laughs> you know, I'm like, wow, I'm not much of a friend, you know? So, you know, we all rely on the capacity to be able to contribute and help others. So uh, sometimes we think that we're going to be 
you know, an inconvenience or that we're a pain in the ass when we ask for help. But when you realize that actually people, humans, we love to make a difference. We love to be of service. So that's something that I for sure am learning to integrate is to show vulnerability, to talk about my woes and let other people see one, that I'm human and two, it's okay. And three, let them to contribute. So, so when someone's in that space, radical humili- humility, accept your humanity, it's okay. You're not the first person to feel like a loser, a failure, that life is pointless, that, you know, there's no, there's no meaning to life anymore. Like, you know, wah, 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 right? I get it. We've all been there. So it's okay. Then share, share with somebody, obviously somebody that you know is kind, loving, cares about you. You don't want to be sharing your vulnerabilities in front of people who want to cut you down. <laughs> They'll use it as uh, evidence against you. Um, But then, you know, in that sharing and seeing that you're held, that you're seen, that you're heard, it's incredible how the energy of apathy and hopelessness can dissipate very quickly. Speaking of vulnerability and, and what you just shared, what would be something that it might surprise the listeners that you've asked for help for with, you know, recently? Oh, gosh. Um, So many things. I mean, mostly, trying to think of late that would surprise somebody, you know, just, just in an intimate relationship, romantic relationship, you know, asking somebody to hear what I'm going through. Like, why, why does it feel like this person is unhappy or being mean or something, you know, and it's confusing for me as a guy who's so sensitive, caring, like, am I doing something wrong? Like questioning myself, you know, so asking someone just to hear me out and I'm, I'm always happy to look at myself, you know, maybe I'm not doing what that person wants me to do, or I, I don't know, but yeah, just to, to allow people to listen, contribute and let me become a better man, a better partner or a better mind coach, you know, all the things that I aspire to be for the impact that I get to have on other people's lives. Hey, thanks for sharing that. I mean, intimate relationships is something that we all struggle with and it's definitely a dance but having people in our corner that we can lean on it's definitely helpful yeah i think they're the greatest um catalyst for evolution right because in an intimate relationship that's you know hopefully really heartfelt where we do feel love with somebody we become very vulnerable but it's only through that vulnerability that we can access these deeper levels of our own constraints right like with somebody on the street or someone in your dms or comments on a post and it's like hey you're a da, 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 and you're an asshole you know, it's like, ah, oh, you might not enjoy it, but it doesn't hurt so much, right? But when it's your partner who is giving you the cold shoulder or who's being uh, angry or making false accusations about your character, it hurts. It's like, that's hard. <laughs> right, it is. And I think one of the hardest parts about intimate relationships is the unknown. Like, how is this going to work out? You know, am I going to spend the rest of my life with this person? If I don't spend the rest of my life with this person, what are they going to say about me? Who are they going to end up with or whatever? And so many people struggle with this as a whole, and it leads them down this path of misery, unhappiness, lack of peace that we've been kind of talking about throughout this conversation. How can somebody get better at dealing with the unknown? Oh, beautiful question. Um, I mean, not too dissimilar to what I've been saying about the human disposition, which is, it's it's part of the game you know that's how i got to where i got to i went through a breakup a girl left me 20 something years ago and it was sort of the at the time felt like the worst thing that happened you know my fear of loss was very established early on when my parents died and so i in ways that i wasn't aware of was always trying to hold on to this particular girlfriend because i was scared of loss but that was the self fulfilling prophecy right and so I realized that, you know, that was precisely what I needed to recognize that I had such a deep fear of loss. And it changed my whole conversation. I never lost anything. My parents died. I didn't lose them. That's a human way of contributing to this victim mindset. Like the question earlier about unfair. It's not unfair. It's difficult. It's unwanted. It's unfortunate, you know, but it's not unfair. So likewise, I didn't lose this person. And so when I saw that and the incessant questions I had in my head of where is she? Is she dating someone else already? Will I see her again? Will I find love like that again? 
you know, they would just keep me up at night until one day I got the answer to all the questions. And it was the same answer for all of them, right? Where is she? Is she dating someone else? Will I see her again? Will, she, will I find love like that again? The answer was, I don't know. I don't know. That was the truth. I don't know where the she is. I don't know if she's dating someone else. I don't know if I'll see her again. I don't know. If... And at that moment, to come back to your question, I realized the very nature of life itself is uncertainty. And it's not going to change. The question is, how can we adjust? To what degree can we evolve to be okay with uncertainty? Because otherwise, people are like, fighting life like you know you've got two channels you can go down life is uncertain is consistent and then we with our fears and inadequacies and insecurities can always try to figure out what's going to happen right that's the rumination that people get so like, what about what, da, 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 da. like it's never ending it's exhausting or we can keep the consistent which is life is uncertain and i'm just going to trust i'm going to do the best i can and i'm going to allow things to unfold that goes back to your first question how can I create my dream life in 30 days? Well, I don't know. I don't know what the fuck's going to happen. You might get the worst piece of news in eight days and then your 30 day plan is right. But if you stay in the present, if you stay in the flow of life unfolding and you become in harmony with life, now you're onto something. It's not success in 30 days. It's perpetual, it's perpetual success because I'm allowing things to be the way they are now. And uncertainty is at the root of so many things. I mean, we talked about, you talked about like stress management as being like a good habit. Somebody needs to learn uncertainty causes, you know, anxiety, um, you know, nervousness, worrying all the things. And that can lead to other poor behaviors. And I, I know that like a big part of what you're going to say to me is, well, radical acceptance, finding harmony. But for a lot of people, that's just it's just hard, especially when it, they're not used to it. Is there anything like, you know, you, you work with people who are in super high pressure situations, whether it's the baseball player that, you know, might ha have the at bat in the ninth inning with the game on the line and it's got to get the base hit or the billionaire that's got to make the top level decision to, to move the company forward or whatever. How do you help them find harmony during moments where their nervous system is incredibly potentially dysregulated? With one of my quotes, I will tell particular athletes, I say, if you're okay with every outcome, then you have nothing to fear. I love that. Doesn't mean it's easy. But Jack Nicklaus, greatest golfer of all times, surpasses even Tiger with his, his wins and accolades. He said, one of the most important parts of winning is being okay losing. So... Instead of fighting our fear of a future that hasn't transpired yet, no one's, on, no one's scared of the unknown. They're scared of what their brain is putting in the unknown. Anxiety, yes, it's associated with uncertainty, but it's not uncertainty isn't the cause of anxiety. The anxiety is the byproduct of the thoughts that we're putting into an uncertain future, that I'm going to get fired, that I'm in trouble, that I'm not going to make it, that I'm going to die. But, so we're being upset by our thoughts about the future, not the uncertainty of the future, right? So that's where if we can be okay with all outcomes, not saying that's easy, then yeah, I might, I might find out that I have cancer tomorrow. I might get run over by a car in a week. But if I sit here and think about it, I'm gonna be in a state of fucking suffering. But if I'm okay with all outcomes, no matter what, what if this game, this game of life, isn't necessarily mine to control? I'm a co-creator. I do the best I can. I contribute as best as I can. I try to, you know, somehow finesse things to go in my way. But what if it's all being handed to me? Can I be okay with that? That's peace. Because otherwise, we're just fighting our own illusion of how we want it to be. But then again, I said, we're not I, I didn't get the memo that you're in charge of how the universe is supposed to unfold. That's a lot of responsibility, first of all. <laughs> I'd rather be okay with not knowing and doing the best I can to be in harmony with what happens. <laughs> Sticking with the, the relationship example and uncertainty, how can people get comfortable with the outcome? Like, So if the outcome, the worst outcome of the relationship is doesn't work out, you break up. This other person finds and marries somebody, you're incredibly upset. 
How can somebody get to a place where they're okay with that out with that outcome? Again, with I get it. I have so much compassion, and it's really hard just being human because we we're basically like little kids, right? So, as a parent, do you have kids? I don't. Just a dog. Okay, right. So, but even the dog could get anxious, right? Like because you are the quote unquote leader. Right, you're the alpha. You're the the owner. So, like as a parent, imagine they're taking their kid somewhere, but the kid doesn't know where they're going, and the kid could be scared for that reason. I don't want to go there, daddy. I don't want to go there, mommy. You know how how many parents listening to this right now can relate to the fact that their kids get scared, they get hurt, they get upset because they don't know the bigger picture. But as the adult, as the parent. We know that taking them to school, even though they don't want to go there, is part of their evolution, and eventually they're going to make friends. It might take a couple of days, but then in a week, in two days, two weeks, they're going to be like, "I can't wait to go to school because I'm going to see my friend." But to begin with, there was that sort of intrepidation. There was this feeling of like, you know, fear, worry. So, what if life is like the quintessential parent that is guiding us? In ways that we resist, like, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. But life is like, no, I understand. But it'll all make sense. The person that you quote unquote left you, and now they're married to somebody else. It might take a while. It could take months. Might even take a couple of years. But then you meet somebody else who is ten x everything that you thought you had in your previous partner. Right? We we hear about this all the time. The person that got fired, laid off, and they're like, well, da da da. But then you see them six months later, and like, dude, I finally started my own company that I've been talking about for years, right? And that wouldn't have happened if I, right? So it's sort of this cause and effect game. So the ultimate word that I use, which is by no means easy to integrate, is trust. Trust that even in ways that we don't understand, that the events of our life as they unfold, even though they may seem like not what we want subjectively, are the nonetheless. At some point, going to be for our benefit, and that—that's not easy. But that's the only way. Otherwise, you're just perpetually fighting life. And people will say, "But Peter, I want to—I want to get rid of the pain right away. I want to get—I want to feel good right away." Because I think people know that they'll find a better relationship, they'll find the better job, but they want it right now. And but here's the irony: the urgency and the impatience is the catalyst for the pain. So. Meaning they not they don't want to feel pain is pain is there, but I don't want to feel pain. I want to find love. I want to find money. I want to be secure. So it's the resistance again of what is that creates the suffering, not the pain itself. You're just having a feeling. You're sad. There's nothing inherently wrong with a feeling. It's just a feeling. I feel sad. I feel hopeless. Okay, that's cool. It's kind of beautiful. It's part of the human experience. Yeah, but I don't want to. Oh, now you're in suffering. <laughs> So they can feel immediately a sense of relief, ironically, by allowing the feeling that they're saying they don't want. Yeah, it's funny how things like that work out, right? Yeah, that's the madness of being human. We, we, we're we okay with joy. Oh, I love feeling happy. I love feeling positive. Okay, well, there's no different than a feeling of I don't feel happy and I feel sad and I feel pointless. It's a feeling. You, As a human being, you have this rich, like, you know, gradient of emotions that we can all have if you make space for all of them then you're never in a state of suffering and i I wish we could just change the relationship we have with our emotions because a lot of our greatest transformations we make come out of these from negative emotions come out of fear come out of anger come out of sadness where we never want to feel a certain way again we never want to date that certain type of person again or whatever the example is but somehow whenever we feel those emotions we're like Oh, this is an awful feeling. I, I got to get rid of it right away. When that's the very feeling that's actually going to be the catalyst for us making that change. We we wouldn't have half of the freaking love stories, whether they be songs, movies, books, if it weren't for the feelings that people have, you know, that then inspire us. So is it really bad that somebody goes through a heartbreak or is that the catalyst for inspiration for somebody else? You know, so again, it's just making space for all of it. Like I said, with my athletes, if you're okay with every outcome, you've got nothing to fear. Well, this has been awesome, Peter. I really enjoy talking to you. I think the audience is going to get a lot of value out of this. I uh, hope so. Sh- share with the listeners, if they're not already following you, where can they learn more about your work? I know you have 
uh, your mastermind program that you're promoting right now? Where can people learn more about that? That's on the website. By the time this comes out, I'm sure, you know, we'll already be in the throes of that. So they might miss out, but they can always join a wait list for the next one. Um, but there is also a platform, a membership that I have called Freedom, um, which is sort of like a monthly membership where you get access to most of my content, you know, workshops, my flagship program for your mind. It's sort of what I'm calling my own version of a conscious Netflix, where you get to both experience spiritual awakening and human optimization. So, uh, and then just Instagram is at Peter Crone. Amazing. Well, I'll be sure to include the links to that stuff in the show notes. And thank you so much again for your time. The audience is going to get a ton of value out of this. Thank you, Doug. Appreciate the conversation. You got it. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, I really think you're going to like this video as well. I'll see you there.